You ready to jump into God's word? Amen. All right, turn in your Bibles to the book of Jonah, Minor Prophets in the Old Testament. We have been in this series and we're wrapping it up today. I hope that you've been challenged. I hope that you've learned something. For me personally, I definitely have. And there's so much that we can learn from this tiny book of less than 50 verses. There's so much packed in here. Three weeks ago, Pastor Austin said this as he kicked the series off. The main purpose of the Bible is to reveal the character of God, to tell us who God is. And today, man, we're going to see God's character very, very evident. The main character of this book is God. It's not Jonah, it's God. The main theme is God's compassion. And we're going to see how the Old Testament points to Jesus in the New Testament as we go throughout today. And at the end, I'm, ch- I'm calling us, I'm challenging us, I'm urging us, can we take some time to pray at the end? And, and, and as we sing, um, let's, let's go before God for people that need him, for people that are lost spiritually, that need uh, a powerful touch from God. We're gonna, that's how we're going to end today. So I challenge you. Even though you've heard the book of Jonah probably preached and taught, you've taught it. Some of you have been longer than, been a Christian longer than I've been alive. And so you know know this. I challenge you, don't tune out, all right? Don't don't tune out and just say, ah, I know where we're going on this one. I'm asking you, man, if your heart is open and if you're really, truly wanting to hear from God, he's going to speak to you. And, And it may be the scalpel that's getting to your heart a little bit today, but I'm praying and I'm asking God to do a deep work in each and every one of us. So in chapter one, let me recap. God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah's a prophet and the the Ninevites were not great people. You've heard this already, but Nineveh was called the city of blood. Doesn't sound very inviting, does it? This is because they would cruelly massacre large numbers of people that they conquered. They were like the terrorists of the day back then. And Pastor Zach mentioned last week that uh, they, they were known for stacking the skulls of the people that they had killed up in front of the city gates so that when you walked by or you're entering, it's like, ah, these are the people I'm dealing with today. Um, and so they, they were extremely immoral people. They were into like even cult prostitution, witchcraft, black magic. There was like this evil presence that controlled their lives. Let's just say this. They were not the type of people that you would bring home to mom and dad. Right? So starting in chapter 3, we're going to read through and we'll pause and we'll talk a little bit and then we'll keep reading. So in Jonah chapter 3, starting in verse 1, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I'm going to tell you. So Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Let's pause for a second. I want you to notice something. Jonah doesn't hesitate this time, right? He's got a second chance. Maybe the fish smell was still on him. Maybe his skin had been dyed bleached white or something from the fish. Who knows? But whatever it was, Jonah doesn't hesitate. God says, go, and Jonah goes, and he had learned his lesson. The other thing I want to point out is this, is the time frame that God gave, 40 days. I realize 40 days is, there's a, there's a lot of connections and stories throughout the Bible of 40 days, but simply put, in my perspective, that was very generous of God right? That was very compassionate of God. We're talking about the God of compassion today. He gave them 40 days. He could have given them one day. He could have given them a few hours. Who knows? But God gave them 40 days to repent and to turn from their ways. Let's keep reading. In verse 5 of chapter 3, then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word of, uh, when the word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne removed his robe from himself, covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat on the dust. And he issued this proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, no person, animal, herd, or flock is to taste anything. They're not to eat or drink water, but every person and animal must be covered with sackcloth, and people are to call on God vehemently or urgently, and they are to turn, each one from his evil way. And from the violence which is in their hands, who knows, God may turn and relent and turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. Church, Nineveh repented. 
This is one of the greatest miracles in the Bible that doesn't get talked about. Nineveh repents. This is a huge deal. Possibly one of the largest revivals that took place. The day of Pentecost, how many people were added to the numbers? 3,000. The end of the book, it tells us there's at least 120,000 people that lived in Nineveh that repents. This is amazing. God did a miracle here. Their hearts were changed. I think this is some of the best news. This is people putting their faith and trust in God. Regardless if anything else was preached, the response of the Ninevites was immediate. Jonah preached one day. That's all it took. And the news spread like that. Listen, the Ninevites didn't want to perish, just like you and I don't want to perish, right? They took this word very serious, and they're like, we're going to change. We're going to do something about it. Remember, up until this moment, they were evil and violent people, but the truth was given, and they changed. They went into mourning and repenting. They turned to God, and so from the greatest to the least, the Bible says, everybody felt the need to humble themselves before God. Let me ask you this. How many times has God gotten your attention to change something about your life and you've ignored it? How many times? Don't answer out loud, please. But think about this. The king, he calls on the people urgently to pray. Not just pray, but what does he say? Turn from your evil ways. The king realized this outward show of repentance isn't enough. There has to be a change of heart. There has to be a change of how we're living. We have to be careful. I say this to myself too. We have to be careful of this religious pretense that we can be insincere and we can claim that we're repenting without the true intention of repenting. It's like going into surgery. If you've had surgery before, you know they, they put you into the room, they prep you, they hook you up with the IV, put you in the wonderful gown, you're all ready to go. Typically your family, you know, a couple of people are there, maybe the chaplain or the pastor's there, we pray, they wheel you off, you go behind this, into this room, and no one sees you, right? Your, your close friends and family don't see you, the doctor's there and the nurses are there, and then you go into surgery. But what would happen if all that happened and you get behind into the surgery room, the cold, cold room that you go into, and all of a sudden you're like, eh, time out. Actually, that scalpel is pretty scary looking. I don't wanna do this. Can we just pretend this happens? And, and you can put a bandage on me, and then you wheel me out. My family doesn't even need to know. Right? Let's be honest, that we can be like that spiritually. We can pretend that we're repenting. We can pretend that this, we put on the show of like, man, I really am serving God, I'm being obedient to God, but we know what's going on inside of our heart and, and we're rejecting the scalpel of God's word and the scalpel of the Holy Spirit speaking to us. The Ninevites realized they needed God. And here's what's wild to me. This is what God expected of his own people, the Israelites, to repent, to follow him, to trust him, to turn from their evil ways. And guess what? He rarely got it. But these Gentiles, these non-believers of Yahweh, they're repenting. This is amazing. Until we realize we need God, that we're lost without him, it's, it's lip service. Our, some of you, your lives have been radically changed by God and you realized and you remember that moment when you know I needed God and I still need God today. And his life is, and my life is based on him and my life is based on his word. It's not a show to me. I really need God. We just sang that song. Do we mean that? Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Ever, every hour I need you. Is that, is that just a word that we say or do we really live it out in our hearts? Because until we realize that, there's no life change. Verse 10 of chapter three, when God saw their deeds and that they turned from their evil way, then God relented of the disaster which he had declared he would bring on them, so he did not do it. This is powerful, guys. God saw their hearts. God saw that there was true change 
and he relented. He decided to not do that, to pull back his anger, to pull back from the destruction. I want you to understand something today. God has more compassion than we will ever understand. God has more compassion than you and I will ever be able to comprehend. Remember the Ninevites, evil, violent people? They prayed urgently to God. God saw their heart. And I want to remind us today, is that same God that they prayed to is the same God that we worship today. He's the same God who is full of compassion. And I want to tell you this, his compassion game hasn't changed. His compassion is still as strong right now, today, as it was in Nineveh, as it was on Golgotha. His compassion is more than we will ever understand. But let's be honest, we can feel very guilty and shameful and regret all the decisions, the things that we've done and said and, and felt in our heart, can't we? We can feel like, man, the this, this sin that I know that I've done, I don't want anybody else to know. And so we believe this lie that God can't forgive us or that God has compassion for everybody else. But man, my mind takes it to a whole new level. I want you to know God's compassion is greater than you will ever understand according to his word. And guess what? His word says he doesn't change. It's the same. So can we pause right now? I want us to pray because if anybody here is feeling that weight, that guilt, that remorse, like, man, I'm a, I'm a sinful person and there's no way God can forgive me. Even if it's for one of you here today, I want us to pause and would you pray with me? God, would you speak to the hearts and the lives of those that are feeling that, that shame and guilt? I pray in the name of Jesus, they would stop believing that lie from the enemy. We, we claim your name over their hearts, over their spirits, over their lives, God, that they would be free and they would realize the compassionate God that they serve. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter four, verse one. But it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. So all of a sudden, guess what? There's this, this massive canyon that we're realizing between the characteristic character of God and the character of Jonah. I realize it's God and human, but there's this massive stark contrast that all of a sudden is be, beginning to be revealed to us. And the end of chapter three, the Bible says God relents. God pulls away from his anger. And in chapter four, what happens? Jonah gets angry. This isn't making sense to us. Jonah isn't being painted in the, the greatest light here. Verse two, then he prayed to the Lord and said, please, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my own country? Therefore, in anticipation of this, I fled to Tarshish. That's a hard word, by the way. Don't make fun of me for saying it. Since I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in mercy, and one who relents of disaster, so now, Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better than to me than life. But the Lord said, do you have a good reason to be angry? Here's the deal. I think the actual reason that Jonah did not go to Nineveh was right here. It's because he wanted to get the revenge on them for the fear that they imposed, the people that they killed, and the evil, violent lives that they were living. Jonah wanted them to get the revenge. Listen, he's probably a bit fearful of going there. We would be fearful too of going to a terrorist organization. Let's be honest. But I think even deeper, you peel back the layers of what's going on here. The real reason Jonah didn't want to go is because he didn't want God to give them compassion. He would rather have died than see God relent from destroying them. Maybe you have a family member that you have a hard time forgiving because you don't understand the way that they're living. Or you have animosity in your heart towards someone that views life differently than you. 
Jonah ran because he knew God's character. Let's be honest. He knew God's character. He said it himself. And he said, I knew that there was a chance of repentance and there was a chance of real change for the Ninevites. And Jonah didn't want that to happen. This is so sad, church. Jonah, he gives this great detailed description of God. All the great attributes of God, the great attributes that he had benefited from and be it was rescued. He'd benefited from that. And now he's angry that someone else is also getting it. Someone that he doesn't think deserves it. Here's what I think. Jonah acts like the prodigal son in chapter one. And now he's acting like the prodigal son's brother in chapter four. Right? He's angry. He's selfish. He doesn't want this to happen. I've been the good one. Why do they get this right now? They've been evil people. They, sh- they don't deserve this. That's how he's acting. It's wild to me to think that he calls this city to repentance and turning to God, yet he's not repenting. He doesn't see it. Verse five, then Jonah left the city and sat down east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and he sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. Man, this guy wants to see Nineveh destroyed in the worst way, doesn't he? He does not like them. Here's what I picture Jonah as. He is a child who is selfish. I know, newsflash, that doesn't happen all the time, but he's this selfish child who doesn't get his way, doesn't want to do what mom and dad are saying to do. And so he leaves, he goes outside, away from everybody else, folds his arms, sits down, and pouts. Anybody ever pictured that with a child before that happens? Yeah? Like, huh, this is not fair, you know? They don't deserve this. Why is that happening to them? I don't like them. All the while, he's benefited from the very same thing. These are the same people made in the image of God Almighty as he is. Yet he has no compassion in his heart for them. Thinking of the prodigal son's brother, do you guys remember, did he go into the party to celebrate? Nope. Jonah, he leaves. Revivals happen, he leaves. Doesn't even join them. Doesn't even celebrate with them. Verse six, so the Lord designated a plant and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to relieve him of his discomfort. And Jonah was overjoyed about the plant, but God designated a worm. And when dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant and it withered. And when the sun came up, God designated the scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and he begged with all of his soul to die saying, Death is better to me than life. But God said to Jonah, do you have a good reason to be angry about this plant? Again, he's asking him, do you have a good reason to be angry? And Jonah says, I have a good reason to be angry, even to the point of death. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on a plant that you didn't work and which you didn't cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight? Jonah shows compassion. Let's summarize it real quick. Jonah shows compassion for one of God's small creation. Yet he's failing to care for this large mass of people who are made in the divine image of God. God is is beginning to reveal more of Jonah than he wants at this point. The last verse of the book. God says, should I not also have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who don't know the difference between their right hand and their left, as well as many animals. There wasn't really this moral perception in Nineveh. There wasn't like a moral judgment that they had, and God needed basically discipleship to happen. God, God wanted him to be the God that they worshiped, and he needed somebody to do it and Jonah leaves have you ever thought what if what if Jonah stayed what if Jonah stayed 
Think of the deep faith that, that could have happened. I, I'm speculating, obviously, all right, but just go with me here. Deep faith could have happened. We could be talking about a city that to this day, even if there's a remnant of believers and God Almighty, we could still be talking about them today. What if he stayed? What if you stayed? What if you stayed in the difficult situation that you're in right now? If we're all honest, we could, we could easily flee and get out of a difficult situation for the most part. Your job is difficult, your boss isn't great to you, whatever it may be, I can go pretty quickly find a new job. You can move school districts. You can go to another state. You can move into the mountains if you want and be a hermit and avoid everybody if you want. There's a quick way of escape. Jonah had a quick way out of there if he wanted to. But what if you stayed in the difficult situation? What could God do through that? Have you prayed and asked God for wisdom what to do? For God's grace and, and compassion in that situation. I believe Nineveh was ripe for revival. It was low hanging fruit. Jonah didn't see it. He just saw the difficulty. He saw the revenge that he wanted on them. We don't understand what God is doing behind the scenes, church. We know, it. We know he is, but we don't see it. I'm challenging you and I'm encouraging you to, to don't stop, not stop praying, don't stop showing up. Ask God for wisdom, ask, ask God for his grace and his compassion. I wanna wrap this up by saying this, is that God wants to reach every person. Yeah, 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 we've heard that before, all right? Because heaven and hell lies in the balance. Yeah, 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 I've heard that before. But here's the real deal, God wants to reach every person because he doesn't want anyone to perish. We love to quote John 3, 16, because it applies to us. But when it comes to the person that is an enemy of ours, it's very hard when we say, anyone to perish? He doesn't want anybody to perish. Do we, here's, the, here's questions that I've been asking myself this week, so you can join in with what I've been wrestling with. Do we really have compassion for every person to know Jesus? Only you can answer that. Do you really have compassion for every person to know Jesus? We have gone through a lot in the last two and a half years. There's a lot of division. There's a lot of hurt. Like, it's like lines have been drawn. And if you don't see eye to eye with someone on a situation, all of a sudden you have to be enemies. I don't think that's how it's supposed to be. I'm not saying have this watered down gospel, but I'm saying this. There's a lot of hurt and anger in our society. Would you guys agree? Yes, and it's, it's been hard for me to make sure that my heart doesn't become bitter and cold towards people that I don't see eye to eye with, that I don't just write them off because they vote differently than me or they, they see a, a situation differently than me. I've had to be careful of that, guys. I wanna say this, having compassion for someone or a group of people does not mean you're okay with what they're doing. Doesn't mean that you give the two thumbs up approval like, hey, great lifestyle, way to go and be a violent evil terrorist organization or whatever, you fill in the blanks. It doesn't mean that at all. We have to separate that. But we have to have compassion for them, right? Because God loves them. We can't be like Jonah and just want all the benefits for us but not for his creation. So do I pray for the people that I disagree with or whom I see are violent, evil people or do I hope that they get theirs and get excited when it really happens? Do I really want every person to know Jesus? Are we masking compassion by singing songs on Sunday morning but not interceding and not doing the work of an evangelist like we're supposed to? Do we just cover it up by coming and singing on Sundays? And this is the extent of having compassion. But when we leave this place, we forget. That's not how it's supposed to be. Have you ever had a situation happen to you that 
revealed something about you, your true colors, good or bad. All of a sudden you're in the moment, you're like, ah, I didn't realize that about me. Let me share one about, about me, okay? Uh, back in 2001, I, my first youth pastor job, I moved up to Spencer, Iowa, and uh, they did like the installment of the pastor at the time. Like, hey, here's the new youth pastor. And, and so we, after church, we go to the park and we have whatever, you know, church does and you have food, right? We're cooking out, we're, we're getting to know each other and visiting. And so I'm talking with someone from the church and there's a, a, a girl in the youth group that I don't know if I had really met. Like I really don't know anybody here. And she comes up to me as I'm talking and has this tiny baby snake. Yes. Megan, you're shaking your head. Nope. I grew up in Huxley, out in the country, and I had seen, you know, lots of bull snakes and garter snakes and cordon snakes. That doesn't mean I was okay with them, right? <laughs> like, there's something about a snake that sends chills down my body, and I realize some are okay with that, and that's fine. You, you do you, but that's not me, okay? Even now, I have chills going down me. This tiny baby snake, this girl comes up, and she presents it to me in front, in my face. <laughs> and it was at that moment that all of a sudden, I did what every person probably would have done. And I ran. <laughs> <laughs> I got out of there. And, and uh, it was, in that moment, all of a sudden it's like, yeah, now everybody knows I don't like snakes. And unfortunately now everybody here knows I don't like snakes. So. Please do me a favor, do not do that to me, okay? You will, you'll see me scream and run away because it's, it's just one of those things. But here's the deal. Uh, all of a sudden, the, the true colors were shown. That was me. That was, that was a, a fear of mine. I think this, this story of Jonah, this book, shines a light on an area that maybe you and I haven't thought about before. We don't have to dig too deep to see Jonah was forgiven by God. He was used by God. He went into the belly of a fish. He was spit up on dry ground. He, dry ground. he went into Nineveh. If this book had ended after chapter 3, Jonah would be one of the greatest preachers ever known. One of the greatest prophets. Because he preached one sermon and 120,000 plus people gave their lives to God. That would be amazing. But how many of you know God sees the intent of our hearts? right? And he knows, and he judges that, and he sees our motives, and he knows us better than anybody else knows us. So that's why chapter 4 was given. And we read this book, and I am unfortunately needing to say this, that this can actually shine a light on us as the church as a follower of Jesus, my own heart, without trying too hard, we can cover up a judgmental and vengeful heart with the appearance of obedience to God. We don't have to try hard, guys. We could come in here and look like we're worshiping and obe obeying God. But if you peel back the layers, if, if you let the scalpel of God's word really get to the heart of the issue here, there's some people here that maybe identify like Jonah. We could come here and we can judge someone based on how they're living or that we don't agree with X, Y, and Z about anything. And we want to see them get theirs. It's like we sit back and we hope and we wait for that to happen. Guys, we can't even pray for another Christian sometimes. Or another church or another ministry. 1 John 4, 8 says, The one who doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. And then in verse 19, it says, We love because he first loved us. If, anyone's, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother... He's a liar. For the one who doesn't love his brother from whom he has seen can't love God whom he hasn't seen. Guys, we are in danger of becoming like Jonah and living out our, our 
prejudices instead of fulfilling our spiritual responsibilities. We can be so focused on, I don't agree, I I don't like that person because we don't see eye to eye or they're doing evil, violent things that we forget the big picture of what God has called us to do. He loves every person. It seems incredible to me that Jonah brings this whole city to faith in God. And yet he doesn't even love them. Do you know who did love the people that he preached to? Jesus, right? The Bible says that our attitude should be like Christ, Philippians chapter two. We need more people acting like Jesus in our world than Jonah, don't we? Why is it harder to find someone who's, who's living like Jesus and acting like them? Someone who stands up for truth, but yet loves deeply and that is compassionate for people to see them know Jesus. Jesus went to, the en- went to enemies. Jonah ran from them. Jesus did what pleased his father. Jonah didn't even obey from the heart. Jesus had this compassionate message. And guess what? So do you. You, you and I, we don't have this message of doom and gloom. We have a message of hope. Jonah had a message of judgment. Jesus took the penalty of sin for us. Jonah wanted revenge. Jesus sacrificed everything. Jonah would have rather died. Jesus had and has compassion for sinners and he proved it by dying for everybody. Jonah didn't even love the people he came to preach to. Think about this. Jesus, he looked upon the city of Jerusalem and he wept. Jonah looks on the city of Nineveh and he's angry. Can we please remember who we're supposed to live like? We're supposed to live like Jesus. Our eyes are set on heaven and we're we're taking as many people with us as possible. And I have to break the news to you if you haven't figured it out by now. That includes people that we don't get along with. That includes people that we don't agree with. That includes the people that have deeply, deeply hurt us. I want us to stand this morning. We're gonna sing the song, I Speak Jesus. And as simply put as this, this is a prayerful and, and almost prophetic type song. Can, as we sing and we pray, can we just speak the name of Jesus over situations? I believe the Holy Spirit has already spoken to many of your hearts today. And I believe that there's someone in your life that needs to know about God. Maybe there's, there's a hurt in your heart and you have a hard time seeing God's compassion for somebody or a group of people. Maybe you're ready to surrender to God. But whatever it may be, as we sing, and if you're watching online, if you sing at home, as we sing this, let's declare the name of Jesus over these hearts, over these lives, over your family, over the people that we don't agree with, over the people that are doing vile and evil things that we can't fathom. Why they would do that? Can we speak the name of Jesus over them? As we do, I encourage you, would you come forward? If you need to receive Jesus, would you come forward? Jesus, today, as we sing, we declare your name over these lives, over these individuals that need you that are lost that are dying and going to hell unless they realize they need you Jesus I declare your name over hearts and lives that are are hurts and they have a hard time God seeing them with your compassionate eyes I pray the name of Jesus over their hearts and lives that you'd open up their lives Jesus we declare your name your name is Jesus it's powerful Jesus we declare this would you respond today as we sing we pray corporately for our souls that need Jesus. Jesus, we pray that you would reach their hearts. God, you love them so much. You sent your son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for every person. And I pray that those that are far from you would realize the love and compassion and mercy that you have that is way beyond that we would ever comprehend and that you would reach their hearts today. God, that you would tear down any walls that have been built up whatever is going on in Jesus mighty name we speak life we speak love into their hearts and their lives and I pray through your powerful Holy Spirit we would be filled up as believers in you 
that we would go and we would do what we're supposed to do. God, that we would show compassion, that we would speak truth, but we would pray and believe that there would be life change that would take place. God, we need you. God, we need you. God, we need you. God, I pray for the person here today that has a very hard time of moving past hurts, that wants revenge. We speak the name of Jesus, that you would soften their hearts. God, that, that they would have compassion. God, we need your eyes and your heart for people. God, we need you. There's only one name that we can be saved, and that's through the name of Jesus, isn't it? The only way to be free from living like Jonah is having more of Jesus in our hearts. The only way that there's freedom and forgiveness is through the powerful name of Jesus. So as you go from this place, I pray that we would go not just challenge now, but we would go and we live it out. So God, help us, equip us, fill us with your spirit. We need you. We need you. I just want to encourage you before you leave. Don't let the, the devil get the best of you. And let your heart be calloused. And let that bitter root begin to grow. Don't let that happen. For some of you, it may feel like this massive tree of bitterness right now. But I promise you, you have a God that you serve, that is full of compassion, that loves you. And, and he's going to help you. He provided shade for Jonah after he's pouting like a little child. He still is a compassionate God. Amen? So ask God to help you. God, as we go from this place, would you fill us and lead us? Help us to live like you. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. We love you guys.